Good afternoon. I would like to welcome everyone to this panel on new regional perspectives, the role of gas in the transition to a lower carbon economy in the MENA region. I'm Halima Croft, Managing Director and Head of Commodity Strategy at the Royal Bank of Canada. We have an all-star lineup here to discuss the outlook for gas in the Middle East. Directly next to me, we have His Excellency Tarek Amala, Minister of Petroleum and Mineral Resources, Arab Republic of Egypt. Next to him, we have His Excellency Yuri Senturin, Secretary General, Gas Exporting Countries Forum. Then we have Fatima al Nuemi, CEO, Abu Dhabi National Oil Company, LNG. Then we have Gerald Stockman, EVP, Joint Ventures, Royal Dutch Shell. Directly next to him, Majid Jafar, CEO, Crescent Petroleum. Oliver Lepush, CEO, Schlumberger Limited. And then finally, last but not least, Saji Sam, partner, Oliver Wyman Group. I thought for the first question, we would actually take a play on the title, which is the question is essentially, what is the role of gas in the transition to a lower carbon economy in the MENA region? So Fatima, I'm gonna put you on the spot here. Okay. What is the role? Okay. Assalamu alaikum and good afternoon. Um, I don't know, Halima, if you've noticed that in, uh, in most energy events that are taking place these days, um, gas takes yeah. a front seat. Um, even those titled oil. <laughs> yes. um, and I think that's an indication of the role that natural gas is playing in the, in the, in the world. And it's, as it's getting increasingly important role. Now, we know that um, demand for energy globally, not just in the MENA region, is, is continuously growing. Um, people are getting access to electricity, population is increasing. Uh, everybody is targeting a certain standard of living that really requires um, energy. And uh, regardless of the cycles of economy, the longer term, a trend is always upwards. And among this, you have governments and companies trying to crack the code of the optimum energy mix right. that provides them with security, uh, that is um, reliable, that is also um, emissions, uh, reduces the emissions and the impact on the environment. And here comes the role of gas. As it's proven that it is less in terms of um, greenhouse uh, emissions, and that's not just me as right. LNG or gas producer um, giving a promotion for, for our product. That's, in fact, a trend that you see, an inverse relationship between the greenhouse uh, emissions uh, whenever the, in, uh, the gas is uh, increasing in the, in the energy mix. And uh, the MENA region uh, and, uh, uh, is going to be, um, because of the youth and the increase in population, in fact, second to the Asian region in terms of growth and demand in energy and gas. Um, and today, you see natural gas in abundance, availability is there, especially after the, the shale gas revolution. Accessibility is there. Um, uh, we see countries tapping into floating uh, storage and, and uh, regasification units, tapping into um, LNG uh, until they realize the uh, potential of their local resources. Some of them never get over the LNG and they, they get addicted to it and becomes part of their, um, of their energy mix in the longer term, like we've seen Kuwait, for example, and, and transferring from the FSRU into um, land-based uh, terminals. So um, longer term, I can see that uh, natural gas with the renewable will be leading the way in terms of energy mix. Your Excellency, Minister. Well, I, I do echo 
what Ms. Fatma was saying, actually, and uh, this is the time of uh, the, uh, the green energy. And uh, when we say that we need green energy, of course, the theme now is renewables and so forth, but we should not forget that all the time we will need to have a base load. So when we talk about base load, so we need still hydrocarbons, but when we talk about the efforts done globally, because this is not a, um, a unique or a, um, an effort that should be carried by one region or one country, it should be carried out by all the world. Therefore, when we talk about the transformation, then we look about the uh, most uh, effective and most green uh, transformative uh, energy, which should be gas. What happens that recently we see that we've been blessed. God has given us this resource of gas and what we need to do and when we talk about MENA region is really how to optimize and how to cooperate for the development of these uh, uh, discoveries and these uh, capabilities that we have uh, for gas. And the idea, in my opinion, is how to use technology and how to be able to uh, cooperate all together, to be able, at the end of the day, to use technology in order to make this gas affordable. And as discussed, as explained earlier, having these uh, uh, facilities, let us say, of floating LNGs, floating uh, uh, storage as well, uh, uh, what we need is to have as well this uh, on a, a master uh, scale that can be helped together for East region. We have started, we as in Egypt, together with our East Mediterranean uh, countries, uh, neighboring countries, to establish somehow a forum by which we can then uh, use our synergies in order to develop these resources uh, using the infrastructure that is existing or to uh, collaborate together in future uh, development of uh, infrastructure. And why is that? The idea is to accelerate the uh, development of gas in order to reach the position and to reach the ultimate goal is to have the uh, uh, more uh, friendly uh, uh, resource, more friendly fuel, and this is gas. And the idea is to make it, as I say, more affordable. Uh, uh, and this will be done when we all together understand the economics of this uh, uh, development. So I think that uh, when I started saying that we are blessed, I think that we are blessed and therefore, we need to smartly uh, develop this uh, resource, as I mentioned, in order to see that as we, we talk, the coming few years is the era of the gas. Thank you. Olivier, any thoughts on this? Yes, I, mean, I, I think uh, I agree with uh, what I heard before. The, the fact that gas in MENA is uh, an obvious transition fuel for energy mix is, uh, is established. No question about it. I think the, the, the region has, is gifted with a lot of resource, mm -hmm. gas resource, but I think there are a couple of challenges that I think we need to overcome as an industry. Um, all these resources are not born equal, as I would say. Hence, mm -hmm. some of them are tight, some of them are deep water, some of them are sour or deep and hot. And I think to find the scale of uh, exploitation of this resource so that it becomes affordable uh, transition or long-term fuel that will participate and dominate the energy mix here in MENA is, uh, is not there yet. And I think uh, despite the, the large discovery, and I think Egypt has been highly successful, I think we need to more work as an industry to have fit solution for every basin, for every resource play, every gas basin and put them to scale so that we can exploit this, make it an energy mix, part of the energy mix, and then it is not only a, a transition fuel, it is a, a long-term fuel here in, in the region. 
because I believe that there is one more benefit that uh, the gas can, can bring beyond its uh, lower carbon footprint, is that it also serves a feedstock for some industry, and it will, by serving the feedstock, help uh, reduce the cost, local domestic cost of the industry, and hence support, uh, support development in this country. So the, the future is bright for gas. Majid, you're shaking your head. Is the future bright? No, I'm nodding, actually. Not okay. I'm, not shaking. I'm f in full agreement. And just to, to pick up on some of the challenges, so from a private sector perspective here in the Middle East on gas, the region has about half the world's gas resources, and yet we're producing only about a sixth. So we're still punching way uh, below our weight. And there are various challenges. Um, one is infrastructure. You know, we don't have enough of the pipelines and terminals, and, and in many... Um, areas where gas really takes off, the, the sector is subdivided so that there are different investor uh, regimes for those other sectors, the midstream, for example, uh, so that upstream players don't have to do it all, and that's more effective for the government. Second, of course, we can't ignore geopolitics. Right. Uh, and it's really, you know, at one of the worst times ever probably in our region uh, at the moment. And yet, other regions have shown, and even this region has shown, an ability to put energy to one side and depoliticize it and maintain long-term cooperation on energy even though the geopolitics uh, might change. I think that's very important. Thirdly is the policy, and that doesn't get enough of a focus right. and a, a debate. Um, our region is still behind, particularly with gas-focused exploration. Most of the gas that we have discovered, including Qatar's North Field, was discovered looking for oil. Uh, in order to really develop the gas, the two areas need policy reform. One is on the downstream prices. We still have half the world's energy subsidies uh, and electricity prices is, is a big one, and that goes up, up the chain. And the other one is on the upstream incentives, having contract models that actually work for natural gas, not just oil, including on price transparency, uh, long-term uh, off-taker agreements, these all need addressing if our region is really to step up and meet its potential uh, mm -hmm. for natural gas. Yuri, your thoughts on this? Mm -hmm. So, uh, you see, say, generally, I would like to say that in GCF we share the opinion expressed by my colleagues. Uh, saying more specifically, I would like that in GCF we even more determined uh, saying that uh, the role of natural gas in the transition period uh, will be of paramount significance and uh, to some extent even decisive. Uh, so, in compliance with the global gas outlook, that is uh, the flagship production of GCF Secretariat on the basis of global gas model, we see, we forecast, uh, that uh, by 2040, uh, the natural gas uh, will be the only fossil fuel which uh, will increase its share in the global energy mix uh, from 22% for the time being up to 26% by 2040. Uh, so, uh, speaking about uh, the recent years, I can say that uh, uh, the recent years, without no doubt, we, we are, have been completely productive uh, for natural gas industry, and uh, the industry uh, has succeeded uh, in adapting, in evolving, and as, 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 as well as uh, in uh, going through some uh, cycles and uh, changes. Uh, 2018 uh, showed uh, that uh, the natural gas demand uh, globally increased uh, by astonishing 4.5% uh, in, in absolute figures uh, for uh, 170 BCM, billion of uh, cubic uh, meters. All these uh, uh, figures and statistics from our point of view uh, say or suggest uh, that uh, natural gas, uh, there's something like a golden age for natural gas. And uh, this golden age is based on the natural credentials of this fossil fuel, uh, being abundant, uh, being flexible, being affordable, being viable, and being uh, environmentally friendly fossil fuels. Uh, this is, uh, this uh, mentioned uh, credentials, uh, this is uh, the solid basis for the further development of uh, natural gas. Uh, the lack, uh, the drawback of uh, the current situation that uh, the people, the communities, uh, the industry uh, is uh, not aware completely and comprehensively of the mentioned, described, highlighted uh, credentials of natural gas. This is uh, the responsibility of our organization. Cheryl, golden age? Yes, I, th I think a golden age and, uh, and, and much more to come, I, I, I guess. Uh, the, uh, the role of the gas is, I, I think, very clear. If you look at the lights over here and the yeah. fact that it's 
nicely cold over here and these screens it's all electricity it all comes from 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 gas and and there's lots of opportunity to have more electrification in the society and we are now probably kind of well 90 percent of the electricity here comes from gas i guess and most of the demand for energy 20 percent currently is, is is can be electrified maybe 30 percent so there's a lot to go for but then there's 70 percent which is not easily electrifiable um, and you need to find another choice for that now i guess that and uh, it was already said that if you have the choice out of coal or diesel then gas is probably the most clean fuel you have available and 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 if you can have a choice between regional gas or gas which comes from fire which you need to import clearly it has to be national or regional gas given distances given security of supply and so on and so forth so the role of gas in mina i think is indeed kind of up to coming to the golden age but i think the role of gas is more than that mm -hmm. i think society will find ways and means to electrify more and to kind of do more in the electrification space. And solar will be a great help. And in some places in the world, it will be wind and there may be other sources as well. But the sun doesn't shine every hour of the day and the wind doesn't blow every month of the year. So you need a partnering fuel to go with that package because ultimately we as customers simply would like to have affordable gas, which is convenient, which I can rely on, less geopolitical kind of influence and, 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 and which is clean and, and, and low carbon. And I think, Gas as partnering fuel is the second part of the golden age you, uh, you talked about yeah. and made it may many years to come. And Saji? It's always difficult to answer when, uh, you know, the same question when, I, I think I completely agree with all my fellow panelists. Uh, I think the fact that gas has a, a fundamental role to play in the transition to a lower uh, carbon uh, energy mix globally is, is, is a given. And, and uh, as some of my colleagues said, uh, it is a transition fuel. Uh, it will not, it's still a fossil fuel, it is a transition fuel. But the fact that it's going to be a lower car carbon footprint fuel. Uh, I think globally, the fundamental uh, transition will happen with replacing coal. Um, in the specific to the Mid MENA region, or the Middle East and the GCC region, coal is not uh, a primary source of, uh, of, of thermal generation, so therefore, it is not as much an impact as it would be globally. Uh, however, I, I have to say that I've been in the region for most, almost a decade, and, and I've seen that the, the role of liquids in power generation has been significant. Now, I have to say that it's been significant, but I'll also, on the same side of the coin, I have to say that it has been significantly reducing uh, the, the burning, burning liquids for, for, for power generation. Now, I think the fundamental, the first point that we need to have in the Middle East is to completely eliminate liquid burning and replace it by gas. And that, through that, you have a, a big change in terms of uh, energy, uh, lower carbon footprint. Um, the other thing that I've also noticed in the last one decade is that there has been a significant gas flaring. Now, gas flaring has been, you know, it's, it's a criminal waste, I would say. <laughs> And again, it's been reducing, and to a large extent, a lot of the countries have eliminated gas flaring, but it is not completely eliminated if you look at the uh, larger uh, Middle Eastern uh, 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 regions. So again, gas flaring has to completely eliminate. I think that's again, uh, will contribute significantly to reducing um, the carbon footprint. And last but not least, I think uh, Mr. Gerard already mentioned that, I think the biggest, um, a role in gas going forward is not to play a, a, a base load or the fuel, or the fossil fuel should not be playing a base load um, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the energy mix of electricity, but rather as more and more renewables come into the picture, variable renewables come into the picture, you need a fuel that can switch on and switch off quickly. And compared to coal, compared to oil, and compared to gas, I think gas is the, is, the, is, the, is the fuel that can do that most efficiently. So I think, I think it's very critical for, um, for, for the Middle East, again, to absorb and adapt gas into its, uh, into its energy mix in a big way. Thank you. Your Excellency, I wonder if we could now sort of dive a little more deeply into the Egypt case study, and if you can talk about sort of the incredible transformation that we've seen in the Egyptian story from, you know, the the importer story to now the export story, self-sufficiency. What has really been the, the key catalyst for this transition in terms of policy? 
and what are the challenges that still really remain ahead? Thank you. Well, to start with, we have to, to say that it is commitment and perseverance. We, we draw the road map and we saw that there is a gap. And uh, in the year, let us say, between 2011 and 2013, we had two change of regimes, we had instability, we had insecurity, then uh, this was reflected immediately on the level of investments of the IOCs in Egypt. Hence, after 2014, when stability started and uh, political stability, uh, this is the first thing that you look at the place where you should invest. Political stability and security. Then, as I say, when we draw the map, the roadmap for what we should do while closing a gap, because immediately, as I said, during this time, uh, our IOCs really reduced their investments. Hence, we saw a sharp decline in our, in our gas production. Then we started immediately to close the gap by importing LNG. So the first thing is to work closely uh, with our strategic partners, our strategic IOCs, who believed in what we were doing in reforms. So we worked in parallel policy reform, and we worked on the economic model, and we saw how the pricing of our uh, offshore gas was doing, and what is needed in order to retain or to attract more IOCs. The second thing was how we had accumulated uh, significant IOC's arrears, overpayment, overdues, more than $6 billion. So we started to reschedule and to focus on how to reduce these arrears back again to a level that would ac be acceptable for IOC's. Third was to see what are the approvals and the permits and the bureaucratic uh, procedures and processes that are uh, delaying the process of the development. So, uh, at the same time, full engagement of the, uh, uh, our well-known uh, local uh, EPC contractors with the full support of uh, the leadership and the government in order to make sure that no, no further delays, no further uh, uh, bureaucratic steps to be uh, carried in order to get approvals and permits to get uh, the uh, project executed. At the same time, and this was focused for uh, the discovered fields already, we wanted to accelerate those discovered fields. But at the same time, we continued on uh, inviting uh, and calling for bid rounds with the new terms that I, as, as I explained. So all together with one important thing, which was the energy and the subsidy reform. Yes. We were heavily subsidizing energy in Egypt, uh, whether it was for electricity or for fuels, and we took it over five years uh, to gradually uh, move from heavily subsidized to removing subsidy. And now we reached a, a, coverage, a full coverage of the expense or the cost of uh, fuels, which is a, a major achievement. Having said so, th this meant several indicators. It meant that we are not just consuming uh, without rationale, so we were now consuming with rationale exactly the fuel that we need. Number two, it sent the good and right message that whatever we sell, we were able to collect and we were able to repay to our IOCs. Number three, we were able as well to develop an important uh, IMF program uh, that supported the reform program that we were doing. And having the IMF with us was also 
a sign of comfort to uh, investors and IOCs. We successfully completed the program. It was a three-year program, and we were able to deliver what we promised so far regarding the economy in general, but among which was the subsidy reform for energy. Uh, we were able as well through this, uh, uh, this, let us say, three, four years to have new comers, new IOCs. Because what happened is that among the work that we've done, here comes a mega discovery, Zohr. With the mega discovery, Zohr, in August 2015, we were able to put together with any the uh, plan of development that developed the gas in 28 months. So from the time of discovery to market was only 28 months. 28 months for an, an offshore discovery, 220 kilometers offshore the, the, the borders, um, the, the shores of Egypt in the Mediterranean with depth of, of about two kilo, kilometers of depth of water. I think that this was uh, a big uh, and world record uh, to execute. Having had the first gas in December 2017, is really was like uh, a sign of seriousness and commitment of Egypt and the government towards doing such important projects and towards IOCs. And since then, really, uh, we have been approached and we've been able to attract the attention of uh, different investors and definitely uh, IOCs that were not operating in Egypt. And investors, because we, as, we, as we said, we, we worked on uh, policy reform, so investors that were interested in investing in the value chain of the gas. So we are having as well uh, uh, a new regulatory gas, uh, independent gas regulator, and we have issued also a law that would allow independent and uh, uh, investors and entrepreneurs to come into uh, uh, all the value chain of the gas, which was only uh, uh, for state companies. And it was like a lobby from the state uh, companies to operate and to deal with uh, the gas uh, value chain. Now it is open for uh, independent and entrepreneur and private sector to join this uh, 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 business opportunities. Uh, since last year and when we were able to accelerate all these projects and among, among which was the most important was so, we were able to reach the self-sufficiency by September 2018 after, after importing, I would tell you, over the years, in, in, in year 15, 16, and 17, more than 8 million tons of, uh, of LNG. And, uh, and now, as I said, closing this gap, resuming exports from one of our facilities, uh, in ETCO, LNG plant, resumed exports to Jordan by pipeline, and now through what we've created, which is the uh, East Mediterranean Gas Forum, we are also cooperating with the eastern uh, uh, neighboring countries to have together to optimize the gas resource that we have offshore still to optimize and to capitalize on the existing infrastructure in order to have, again, uh, uh, the uh, possibility of accelerating this resource that we have in order to use it to our people in the region and to monetize it and to, at the end of the day, to, uh, to let our people uh, feel the uh, let us say, the, uh, the, the well-being and the welfare of this resource, because it is useless to have a gas offshore, under the water, without using it. So the idea is to 
cooperate all together again. So I just wanted to reiterate what we started at the beginning in the opening, that this is the era of gas. Gas for prosperity. Exactly. Now, Fatima, could you talk about the master plan that ADNOC has undertaken on gas? Well, um, ADNOC went through a huge transformation as a whole the past uh, few years. And if anybody one day chooses to write a book on this experience of transformation, yeah. I think the transformation in the gas sector needs to be a chapter by itself. Okay. And uh, just as, as early as beginning of 2016, I was in the role of looking into the gas master plan, and the picture was not pretty. The graphs that we were looking at were all in the red, showing a shortage. And as a national oil company, our obligation is to satisfy the local demand. Yeah. Demand was very high to be met by, by the resources. And yet it didn't make sense because we have one of the highest gas uh, reserves. We were thinking of closing our export facilities of LNG by 2025. And I think I'm lucky that this changed. It wouldn't have been exciting to be in this role if that was the case. Yeah. So that was the picture then. It took few decisions, and it's really decision and changes and mindset. Because in this region, it's a fact that gas was always looked at as a byproduct. And although it's painful to think of the, the demand and the see, the, uh, but still it's in the mindset of an oil producing company right. or country that this is a byproduct. So the main decisions that were made, mainly reform of the gas prices to reflect its real value. And that's applicable to all sectors that utilize gases. And that switched that mindset. So things were taken for granted, gas was taken for granted, and now it's got a value that transformed the demand curve and people became uh, uh, rational. It also encouraged um, uh, the, the utilization of other sources of energy, hence what we've heard this morning about uh, the, the vision of 2050 yeah. and the energy mix and solar and uh, renewal becoming 50% of, of the energy mix in the longer term. So this in terms of the demand side and on the supply side, it also encouraged that we tap into possibly previously not an economical source of, of, of gas because changes in, in prices attracted partnership attracted us to look into these new sources. So now we have the sour gas uh, fields being developed. Uh, in fact, we have one of the largest mega projects already developed, which is uh, Shah Field. Uh, we have uh, uh, the Russia concession, which is quite an interesting project because it's, it's an, an environmentally uh, protected area. It's in shallow water. It's, um, it's, it's got its um, uh, challenges technically, yet it's possible because of, of the decisions that were made. Um, so there were these, these factors that made it possible for uh, this gap and this picture to change into green. Mm -hmm. And that's why the announcement came during last EDIPIC yeah. that we are, in fact, transforming yeah. uh, into a self-sufficiency and ultimately possibly becoming a, a, a net exporter in the longer term. So uh, th this is, in short, the, the, the story of, of Abu Dhabi. Now, at the same time, ADNUK is, is uh, of course, aware that we have um, an obligation towards the, the emissions. So <coughs> there is a focus on the reduction of our flaring. In fact, 75%, I think, the, the, the reduction since the 90s in terms of flaring. Um, the, the project that Dr. Sultan mentioned, which is the carbon capture and injection, so that it complements e each other. Um, but with all this effort put to, uh, let's say, untap gas resources, 
uh, that does not really conflict in case uh, with the fact that its share in the energy mix is going to reduce. Today, yes, the, the room is cold because of natural gas. It's almost 100% of uh, uh, the gas, uh, but 38%, um, uh, I think that's the 2050 picture. Um, this will free up the gas to be utilized in industry, and we have ambitious plans for um, uh, petrochemical and, and turning Ruiz into one of the leading uh, uh, industrial cities. Um, so, uh, and of course, keeping the LNG running for longer. Now, we've heard of the policy successes. Imagine when we talk about Iraq, I mean, it has this enormous gas endowment. How does it fit into the story? And you, know, you really have emphasized so much the need for getting the policies correct. How does this story sort of unfold in Iraq? So I think despite all the differences within the region, there are these common themes. Yeah. And actually the points that uh, Fatma just made are exactly right. It, it takes th the right decisions on policy right. uh, to encourage that that development. And because the national oil companies have been focused mainly on oil, as, as she right. said, there's real room for the private sector to play its role, I believe, in all the different parts of the gas value chain. And gas is different from oil because it tends to be more local in terms of links to the power sector and to industry, to, to you know, feedstock for industry. So taking one example of a project that we executed in, in the north of Iraq in the Kurdistan region, we've invested over a billion dollars. We've been producing gas now for over 10 years. We're about 400 million cubic feet per day, looking to take that up to a billion cubic feet per day in the next three years, actually. And we got PwC to do an assessment on what was the economic value add uh, of this investment. And the interesting thing in terms of the points of displacing liquid fuels, in this case it was diesel, which would have been burnt in the power stations. But in other countries, Kuwait or Saudi, it's even crude oil. And the displacement of diesel saved over 30 million tons of CO2. And we expect to save over 80 million tons of CO2 in the next 10 years. So this is what people don't really think. They think, oh, fossil fuels, and as was heard this morning by Dr. Fatah, it's wrong to put them all in, in the same bucket. Plus, that investment led to economic multiplier effects, because you're providing electricity and therefore prosperity, of up to $18 billion for the local GDP, because we, it went from two hours electricity per day to almost total uh, electricity per day. So that aspect of meeting energy access, which people forget, that's you know, number seven right. of the SDGs, right. and that's critical for the developing world. Uh, you know, sometimes you know, the developed world, of course, climate change affects us all, but the developed world is like this you know, really fat man that's eaten so much and still eating, and saying to you know, this uh, skinny young girl who's just started to grow, which is the developing world, from an ener energy basis and saying, don't do what I did, yeah. okay? And we heard this morning, unless you create the incentives, you can't just say, don't do what I did. I mean, we heard from right. Fatah Bay, China and, and Asia is adding a new coal plant every week. Right. So it has to be on a global level, the right incentives uh, for the developing world to make that switch from coal to gas. And when it's a transition fuel in the sense that it's a fuel for the transition to a low carbon economy. I don't want people to think it's a transition in the sense that it's a bridge to get us to renewables. As the UAE has wisely uh, targeted in 2050, it is a necessary complement to renewables, almost equal, 40%, 40% of renewables with, uh, with natural gas. And it, it is going to remain an important uh, complement for decades to come. Majid, you brought up renewables. And Saji, I want to turn to you on the question of renewables. Is it a, sometimes a competitor? Is it a partner? How do we think about renewables and gas in the transition? Yeah, I think, uh, I, I think there, is, there is this notion that uh, gas is somehow competing with, uh, with renewables. But I, I believe that um, gas is absolutely not competing. Um, gas has got several uh, uses. Um, fundamentally, uh, where they overlap with renewables is on the power side, and one may argue whether there, there, is a, there is a substitution question there. 
But gas has got, you know, it, it's a feedstock, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a fuel, it's got several other uses in terms of industrializing a, a country that it cannot be compared. Um, specifically to renewable energy, um, with the reduction in, 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 uh, in, in the price, the levelized cost of electricity in renewable energy, yes, the renewable energy has reached a stage where it is equivalent or even more competitive compared to gas, depending on the gas price uh, in, in specific markets. So from that perspective, uh, yes, uh, renewable energy, when, you, when you're trying to add capacity into the grid, uh, one may consider an option, a, a, a substitute, whether we should go with renewable or, or, or gas. Uh, that's the only time they would, they would potentially, I would say, compete from a substitution perspective. But I would rather say that uh, if you look at renewable energy integration into the, into the grid in the longer term, it is absolutely necessary to have gas as part, of the, as part of the energy mix. Renewable energy cannot exist without, without a, 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 a fundamental uh, technology that provides the flexibility. And today, the flexibility, the best flexible option that, can, that, that renewable energy has in terms of covering the, the intermittency of, of renewable energy is gas, because you can switch on, switch off um, turbines, uh, with specific and, and more and more turbines are being designed to be able to do that without having an adverse effect on, on its lifespan as well as O&M costs, etc. So going forward, I think uh, renewable energies is, and, 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 uh, and gas should coexist uh, and has to coexist uh, as part of the, uh, as part of the uh, energy mix. Olivier? Yeah, I think I, I agree with one, one uh, maybe very long-term perspective. And I think the long-term perspective is... Uh, is that energy storage is most likely the solution uh, to this intermittent and peak and trough of any, any energy uh, source. And, and at present time, the, the gas in the next maybe 30, 50 years will act as a, as a support partner to uh, renewable. Uh, long term, there might be, uh, and there will be, certainly energy storage in the form of hydrogen, in the form of... Uh, EV batteries and other means that could substitute and eliminate this form of, uh, of low carbon uh, substitution or complementary. But again, this is long term out. I think energy storage is not necessarily uh, uh, at scale and at, and at economical value available today. So it's not something that will substitute or put out of, uh, out of uh, role the, the gas. And the gas, as was said, is clearly a feedstock to the industry, uh, and, and there are other benefits, and, and one of them linked to the, to the storage is that the techniques that are used for exploitation of gas also apply to carbon capture, sequestration, yeah. applying to hydrogen, applying to, to different techniques that will, over time, complement and be part of the energy mix. So investment in and at scale into gas uh, today in, in MENA and will prepare the long-term future of uh, sustainability of energy and I think it will be still ba be part of it but not necessarily on the same mix in the next 20 years that it will be beyond. Gerald? Yeah, so I, I fully agree with uh, the left-hand side <laughs> over here with all the speakers, eh, as a matter of fact. Yeah. Uh, I, I think there's no competition between gas and, uh, uh, and uh, renewable energy. Uh, there may be sometimes in the sense of a substitution option, and that's good because if we find in that competition cheaper, uh, uh, more affordable ways to develop gas, or if we find in that same competitive process more cheaper and better ways and more reliable ways to have renewable energy, it's good for everybody. But by and large, it's partnering, it is enabling, it's not about forever. Uh, a former minister uh, said once, uh, the Stone Age didn't end because of uh, the stones. We run out of stones. And we will, and there comes a point where we will probably kind of have moved on from gas. But it's not the relevant discussion right now. And right now, gas can really power the society with affordable, uh, 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 low-cost energy in partnership with, uh, with renewables. So, um, completely uh, 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 in agreement with that. I think there's the point beyond. We currently have seven billion people on the planet, seven and a half, it will be nine billion people in 2050. I hope that many people will be able to afford 
the wealth which some of us already are able to, uh, to afford, yeah. which means that the demand for building blocks in the chemical industry, the demand for all these products, which over and above the light and the cold and the television screens kind of allow us to, to sit here as well, will be on the increase. And I think gas will continue to have a role in that space as well. Hey, Yuri, you just had a meeting at the International Renewable Energy Agency with the Director General. Is this the ultimate sign of partnership in terms of gas and renewables? Mm -hmm. You're completely right. Uh, of course, uh, visiting this country, by the way, one of uh, the key members of GCF, uh, I used uh, the unique opportunity and I paid a visit to the headquarters of the uh, International Agency upon Renewables. Uh, we are cooperated, uh, but very slight and superficially, uh, before this meeting uh, with, the, I mean, uh, the, uh, with the organization. Uh, but uh, uh, on the basis of this uh, uh, cooperation, the start of this cooperation, we analyzed uh, the statutes of uh, both entities and we learned found uh, that uh, there are a lot of similarities in our statutes. Uh, more of that I could like to say that our member countries at the same time time are member countries of uh, IRENA. Just uh, these two factors, and there are a lot of others, uh, we found uh, that uh, there's a, a fundamental basis uh, to establish bridges uh, with IRENA and to start cooperate uh, uh, practically. Uh, so uh, that's why I dared uh, to communicate with the Director General of IRENA, Francesca La Camera. Uh, we had a very productive and, from my point of view, promising meeting uh, the day before yesterday. And we agreed uh, to establish a joint working group upon uh, the uh, learning and uh, studying opportunities in front of us and how to start uh, cooperating, how to start joint research work on the basis of mutual funding, as well as uh, we uh, uh, agreed uh, to, uh, uh, to, to, to put forward uh, some initiatives uh, on the basis of the uh, renewables of natural gas uh, credentials. I'm talking about environmentally friendly uh, character of uh, natural gas and uh, uh, renewables. And uh, if you don't mind, one uh, step uh, back, uh, uh, I'm talking about the Egyptian case. It's yeah. of uh, pivotal importance for GCF uh, because uh, Egypt is one of our key member countries uh, founding GCF and participating very actively and efficiently in GCF activities. I would like to underscore that in spite of uh, some, some temporary period of, uh, for that country, when uh, the country ceased uh, its uh, natural gas expert, uh, the country kept uh, uh, loyalty to natural gas and continued its membership, continued its uh, membership in GCF. Uh, so I would like uh, to say that uh, we are proud uh, that our Egyptian colleagues, uh, they uh, uh, they were very loyal to natural gas, as already mentioned, and uh, they were very determined uh, in their efforts. Uh, they undertaken tremendous attempts and tremendous efforts, and uh, due to that, uh, they, we, have, we see such a huge result. Uh, the country came back and uh, joined uh, the club of uh, natural gas exporters. I would like to, uh, s to stress specifically that uh, this uh, result is in line uh, with the Egyptian government efforts uh, to uh, supply natural gas for domestic usage. And, uh, uh, of course, uh, it's, uh, this uh, sample, this significance of uh, great importance uh, for us, and, uh, of course, uh, we are uh, deeply interested uh, in uh, continuing uh, cooperating with the Egypt government uh, in the uh, relevant sphere. And on the topic of, sort of cooperation, I mean, what's the prospect for regional gas markets in the region? Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Yuri, for that. Actually, uh, to complement uh, what I started and what I was talking about and what the position uh, that Egypt has reached now, I think when we thought of uh, uh, being now and to resume the uh, exports, we thought, as we said, uh, to uh, have a more macro overview for the region. And the cooperation in that has started by saying we need to have a forum where we can underneath have this cooperation in order to make sure that we together complement each other. So we have some of the neighboring countries, let us say like Cyprus, 
it has got the gas, but don't have enough market for uh, the consumption, and does not have currently the existing infrastructure that would be able to develop and to monetize this gas and to get it uh, processed through. So therefore, part of that was to uh, have, for example, a, a connecting pipeline. And this was something that we've agreed together on. And this is a model where uh, we are talking on optimizing with our current infrastructure, which is the LNG facilities and so forth. So uh, this is from one side, as well as, let us say, the Arab gas pipeline that we had, and now we are using it to uh, export gas to Jordan. So with the uh, uh, growing uh, uh, exploration and discovery in the region, we need to then uh, uh, use this uh, uh, basin of the East Mediterranean and perhaps growing more because this is what we have uh, uh, seen recently from interested countries to join this forum. And then, as we said, more cooperation. But the last point that I need to just mention is that this will need to uh, really review the uh, investments and to use the technology to reduce the uh, capex used and then to be able to afford more and speedy development of gas. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you. I was given the five-minute warning, which is now probably the two-minute warning. And so I wanted to end on a final question and pick on one of the panelists. So I'm going to go with Majid. Um, you brought up geopolitics, and you were a frequent commentator on geopolitics. And we spend a lot of time talking about the geopolitics of oil. Will we increasingly be talking about the geopolitics of gas? And what will be the most salient issues in two minutes? So um, I think geopolitics is even more significant with gas or more impactful because oil is fungible and it can be stored, it can be uh, transported, and it's a global commodity. Uh, with gas, we have the situation where you know, we're, we're importing LNG from the United States to this region, despite yeah. this region having much more gas and more cost-effective gas. So without going into all the details of the whys and the wherefores, that shows you what, a, what an impact that the, um, in addition to the policy aspects and the infrastructure aspects, the geopolitics has been an impediment. Uh, and yet, in OPEC, you have an example right. where countries who are on opposite sides, sometimes of war, I mean, in the case yes. of Iraq and Iran in the 80s, open war, uh, are able to cooperate and they're able to put aside the um, conflict and the geopolitics in favor of long-term uh, energy. Because gas in particular is typically, you know, 20 plus year contracts, massive capital uh, investment. And the way that's go and, and in the mean in those 20, 25 years, the alliances and the friendships right. and the animosities and the wars are all going to change and evolve, as we have seen, right. looking back 25 years. So if there can be a way, and maybe it is through Yuri. the gas exporting <laughs> yes. uh, uh, forum, yes. where such um, partnerships are established yeah. separate from uh, the short-term uh, geopolitical tensions, I think that would really help in addition to the necessary policy reforms that we heard, you know, Egypt has undertaken, Abu Dhabi yeah. has undertaken, uh, you know, the UAE is kind of a role model uh, yeah. also in importing gas by LNG and pipeline while prioritizing and reforming the regulatory regime to develop domestic uh, resources in parallel. Uh, so all of that needs, needs to happen. But if the geopolitics can be somewhat insulated, that will also help. Well, this was an extraordinary session. I would like to thank this incredible panel and thank everyone for attending and for the WEC for putting on this session. I bring this to a close. Enjoy your evenings.